Hello, welcome to my channel or welcome back if you're a subscriber. I go by Riddle and I'm going to teach you some things today. So I have to tell you, um, people, a lot of people think that you have to be born into money or you have to have a college education in order to thrive. I had neither, and I've traveled the world. I've experienced phenomenal things, and I have had a ton of freedom. A lot of people are afraid of money because they feel like there's this chain or this dirtiness to it. But where the real chain is, is when you don't have any freedom and you're limited to how much money you can make. Now, there is, of course, poverty, but in my observation, living in poverty and then living in abundance, I think that a lot of times poverty can be a um, psychological state. You know, I lived in a neighborhood growing up where there was a ton of violence. But the fact was, even the people who are on welfare were getting enough food to be morbidly obese. They had three television sets and a large, warm house with all three utilities. Is that poverty? No, that's pretty comfortable. Um, they were actually living more comfortably than we were, my dad working a factory job. But the problem with the people was that somebody had convinced them that they had less and they were less and that they were poor. And so there was this degree, a large degree of people coveting what they had and people um, basically trying to take other people's stuff. They acted like animals with, 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 with a lack of resources. But in fact, if the community would have come together and shared resources and helped to protect each other and take care of each other, it could have been a paradise. But, you know, this is the human condition where we have been convinced that really if we come together as a community and sacrifice our individuality or our resources, then it's a cult, you know, or, you know, we laugh at these things, this idea of, of sharing and working together and it's tribalism. And believe it or not, that's why we're all here today because we all came from tribes humans had to work together to survive. So now we're living in a time that humans have this very pronounced idea of hyper individuality and the thems and the theys and why we have to be so different and why we are so different. And the focus is on constant me, 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 and why I need to separate myself from other people. And this will destroy humanity. This will destroy humanity as our disconnection from nature has destroyed the earth. So this being said, at a very young age, because I had a rough childhood, I realized that I needed to heal those wounds. And I wasn't gonna be able to have the luxury of healing those wounds if I didn't have a lot of time alone. A lot of time, not just alone, but a lot of time in peaceful healing spaces. So my first move was to, of course, escape my toxic environment, toxic family, toxic city. And then the next move was to create my own business. And you have to understand, I did this with nothing more than my bare hands. And 
I was taught the basics of basket weaving. Uh, my friend would go out into the woods and rip down wild grapevine and he would weave it into baskets and he would sell it to flower shops and individuals. So I kind of did an apprenticeship with him. But at one point I realized that he was a terrible businessman and that he was always going to be paying me squat and that there was no future in it staying as his apprentice. And he didn't see the value in my business ideas. So I didn't compete with him. I moved to a larger town with more money. And um, as I was working a regular job, I started building this craft business. And it was it didn't take very long before I was able to buy my own van, pay cash for it, and uh, had a job that was paying rent. And then from there, I moved out to the country. And it was a, you know, most people thought this little house I lived in was a shack. And they talk about, you know, how awful it was. But for me, the freedom, because it was so inexpensive, the freedom to not have to worry about paying the bills and the freedom of having, you know, 15 to 20 acres around you, that was, they'll never understand the value of that and that I needed that healing. I needed to recapture my childhood that I, that I never had a chance to, you know, to experience the safety and the freedom that a child should have to grow into a healthy, well-adjusted adult. Um, I think I may have one advantage. Both of my grandparents on my mother's side were entrepreneurs. This doesn't mean they were wealthy. This doesn't mean that they made a ton of money or any amount of money that was ever passed on generationally. This just means that they had the uh, capacity and the tenacity that they didn't want to work for someone else. And both of them had their own businesses. And they've recently proven scientifically that people who are entrepreneurs have a certain type of brain. They have a certain type of brain that makes it easier for them to uh, intuitively follow through with the things that you need to do to have your own business and to make money. And I have that brain. I definitely have that brain. And that did not come from any kind of education, but I did at least have the example of my grandparents distantly having their own businesses. And that was, a, I saw that as a powerful thing. And um, I saw how people treated them. And I did, and everyone, you know, I had a respect for that. And it was, um, it was mysterious to me as a child, because I was never close enough to them to really see what they were doing or how they were doing it. But um, it was just enough to show me that, yeah, that is definitely a possibility for my future. If they did it and I'm a branch from them, I can do that too. So now after all of that babbling, I'm going to show you how someone with a wealth mentality sees opportunity. Sees, as in sees visually, and seizes, takes opportunity because... Uh, recently, a friend brought a young lady by my house, and uh, supposedly she'd worked at an uh, organic orchard on the East Coast and uh, was interested in plants, very interested in plants and potentially starting her own business. And I thought it would be great for her to be an apprentice. And the first thing that was kind of a red flag for me is that, you know, she's a new person and she showed up invited to my house empty handed. Now, I know that's an old fashioned, perhaps it's an antiquated idea, but to someone who has a wealth mentality, to someone who has, someone who shows up with nothing when invited to your home, that shows a level of like poor, poorness, poor civilities, um, a level of, of poor, um, she was raised without something, some basic 
manners um, it, uh, that she, you know, it doesn't have to be anything elaborate, but the fact is you don't show up to someone's house when you're invited empty handed because the person definitely won't, um, won't be impressed by you. And if you're out to make an impression, you never show up to someone's house empty handed. It's a very, very basic thing. So the second thing, you know, as I talk to her, I realized that um, she she was smart enough and she was kind enough, but she just had that thing, that thing that so many people have, this poorness. And I don't mean like financially. I mean that just she was cut off. She was cut off and she was even with her emotions, even with her communication. I mean, when you're around me, I'm just give, 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 give on many, many different levels. So now I'm, you know, I'm learning to be more wary of people that are in that poverty mentality, the people that think they have nothing to give, you know, when actually with a little bit of effort, you can always come up with something. And the saddest part about this story is I could have changed her life overnight. I literally could have practically handed her all the skills and all the resources for her to be making really great money, doing what she loves in a matter of weeks, in the matter of weeks. But because of her poverty mentality, because of her closed her clothes, how she's closed off from connection, she, I probably never see her again. Even though I mentioned, like I gave her some crumbs, you know, I gave her, and she said, oh, those are great ideas, and I'd like to this, and I like to that. But I can tell, I can tell when someone is a loser. And what I mean by a loser is somebody who makes choices even when they're right in front of them and turns away from opportunity and back to creating a difficult life for themselves. People, a lot of people, and it comes down to self-awareness and self-esteem, choose what's familiar to them, which is misery and hard work versus, and the collar versus learning something new, trusting trusting with an educated trust though not not a naive trust and um like seeing and and seeing um not just what i can get but what i can share and that's what i see with a lot of people in the area that i live in even people that have a lot there's this they're so great at talking about community and so great at taking but they they're so stingy when it comes to sharing or giving. And it's really just gross to me. It's gross because people around here have plenty, plenty. And yet it's this gross, pervasive poverty mentality or soul like poverty that is just, I don't know, it's the opposite, the total opposite of what I'm into. So let's get to the nitty gritty. So we're going to start with, this is, these are all different ways of looking at things, uh, poverty version of it or normal people version of it versus wealthy, wealth-minded, prosper, prosperous version of looking at it. These are two plastic totes, 20-gallon totes from Home Depot. Uh, 20, 25 years ago, I purchased $10 worth of compost worms. What this does is I can put all my cardboard in here, all my food scraps, all my weeds, and the compost worms turn it into fertile soil. There they are, see them all? We got some more light in there. And it's a different kind of worm. It's not like the regular one. So after my initial purchase of these, I realized that they populated really quickly. And so what do you think I did? I got some more totes on sale that were like really attractive colors. I 
made a logo. It was Mr. Wormy, the compost worm, and he had a little bow tie, and I made a stencil of that, and I spray painted that on the top of the lid of the tote. And then I designed it in a way that it could drain so you could have the worm tea in the bottom to feed your plants, and I put some starter compost in there along with a handful or two of compost worms, and then I sold them online for $40 a pop to people who wanted to compost on their decks or at their homes. And so um, it was um, back then I was making like a $30 profit off of a seven to $10 investment back then. And since then, um, you know, it doesn't matter. I've kept them going. I don't sell the worms anymore, but that's how a rich person thinks. That's how somebody who want, doesn't believe that they're a victim to the economy or limitation thinks. I'll show you something else. Do, 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 do. Oh, okay, we'll go over here. So you're growing a garden. And uh, let's say you have lettuce and arugula or sunflowers or what have you. So this particular arugula was a volunteer. And you can see, I let it bloom all the way out. These are all seed pods. And each seed pod, when we break it open, you can kind of see that, contains uh, probably a dozen, 10 to 12 seeds. So this, it would just naturalize in the garden. They'll just drop in and make more. Or the sunflower eventually will make seeds. Or these tomatoes, if we don't pick them all, or when we pick them, we can collect the seeds. Have you seen the price of organic seeds online? Every one of these vegetables including that arugula that just made its own thing. What I'll do, I'll take a big plastic container. I will bend that whole wad of branches and seedlings into it. I'll beat the hell out of it. And there will be thousands of organic arugula seeds. And then I'll put them in a fancy little envelope. And that envelope will be sold for five or six bucks a pop. So that one plant will probably conservatively make 120 to 160 dollars i don't know just that one plant selling seeds you sell those seeds at the market you can sell those seeds online sell those seeds on um etsy you could sell those seeds on it's important too before you start something like this that you know that there's a mark that you have somewhere to sell it it's very important that you've established your market because if there's not a buyer, then there's no reason to do it. But with the way the internet is now, and I also recommend if you go into a situation that you're making something that you have to mail it or ship it, that you go ahead of time and find out what your exact shipping costs are before you commit to that because shipping can be expensive. And if you're not making at least doubling your money or more, then you need to find something better to do. I'm gonna move on to my next thing, bamboo. So we had some friends that had to move because they were selling their property and they had a ton of wild of bamboo. They had black bamboo, they had golden bamboo. And I went over to their house and I dug a bunch out of the ground and I put it in pots and guess what? Bamboo is really expensive to buy. <laughs> For a little tiny five gallon pot of it, it can run $60, $70. So what do you think I'm gonna do with this bamboo? And it's really prolific. You buy the dirt if you can't make the dirt. You buy the dirt when it's on sale at the end of season as much as you can afford at Home Depot. You take the cuttings, you know, the root cuttings from the bamboo. You get it started in those pots. The next thing you know, you have 10 pots of bamboo. If you can get 50 or 60 bucks a pot, you've just made five or $600 like that. All it takes is some effort and a couple months for it to acclimate and grow into the pot a little bit. And you've got a bamboo farm started. Again, 
This is the way you do it. On to our next example. This is a blackberry bush. Now this just came up. It could be even a wild blackberry bush. And it, it wasn't being watered. And initially it was just looked like a dying weed. There was maybe just two little branches coming up. But I thought to myself, if I start watering that, what will happen? <laughs> what will happen? And it has made me so many blackberries. I fed it. I started watering it. I nurtured it. Just like you have to nurture anything in life. I was patient. And now I've got this amazing blackberry bush going where most people would have pulled it out or they would have let it die, not understanding, not being sensitive to this opportunity that was right in front of us. So now, how do I profit from this? Well, as this plant grows, I've already made jellies and jams from it. I can sell the fresh berries. I can also take these runners. You can see the runners. And what you can do is just take the runner and bury it under the soil, dig a hole and push this down under the soil. And then this is going to make a whole nother blackberry plant. So I can continue to propagate these. So I have more berries so I can sell more of these. Or are you ready for the next level? The next level would be that I get two and a half gallon to five gallon pots, fill them with soil, take the runners, and plant them directly into those pots of soil. So the runners are automatically rooting into those pots of soil. And then once the roots have established, I cut them off the plant. I have pots of blackberry plants to sell. This way, I'm already getting the berries and I'm going to have pots of blackberry plants to sell. You can check the price of those, they vary. But I have thornless ones that I can propagate and I have these wild ones I can propagate. And so let's say you're getting, you know, even if you go cheap on it, let's say you're getting, um, you know, 10, 10 to $20 a pot, it all adds up. And what you have to remember just because you don't think something has value because you have it and it's like a weed in your yard doesn't mean that somebody else out there in the world isn't just starting out with growing things. And so it may be the first mint plant they buy. And we all know I regret so much planting mint in my front garden, but I thought it was going to help control the gophers. So I did it and now like I'm pulling it out by the fistful. I'm feeding it to the chickens. I'm using it as chicken bedding. Again, nothing goes to waste. But that being said, mint. All you have to do, so let's say you're just starting out and you don't have a lot of capital. So you go like, oh, I don't have any money to buy pawns. Uh, well, you gotta figure that out. What you do, you start talking to people who are gardeners. Or maybe you go by someone's house all the time and you can see they got lots of flowers and they're big gardeners. Or you put a note on, on, on uh, Facebook or start trolling Facebook and ask people. Most people have plastic pots piled up that they don't want to throw away and they don't know what to do with them. You just find the free pots. This is what people who succeed do. They put the energy into the solution and not the problem. And they problem solve and they figure ways to get resources, to make resources, to create resources. And if someone is super generous to you, even if it takes a couple months, again, don't show up to their house empty handed. Give them something back. Give, give, give. The more you give, the more you will receive. And sometimes you're not going to get back from the sources that you put your heart into, but trust me, it's been my life motto and I never regret my generosity. Let's show you some other things. So this is going kind of next level, but... These are my olive trees. And olive trees are pretty expensive now. So let's say you wanna grow olives. You got a good environment for it. 
but you can't afford the olive trees. But you've seen olive trees. You've seen a neighbor that has them. You have a family member that has them. You can take the branch from the olive, you pull it down to the ground, just like the blackberries. You plant it like I've done here, and this roots will root, and then you will be able to, in about six months, after keeping that watered and taking care of it, you will be able to dig this up and have the start of a mature olive tree. Here's another one over here. This is a better example. See where I pulled this branch down? It's in the soil there, and now it's growing here. This is the tree. So now I can cut that off here, dig that up, and I have made myself a new Kalamati olive tree. And you've seen the price of them online. They're expensive. So let's say I take all these lower branches and do that and get those growing in pots. Again, we're probably looking at a thousand bucks, a thousand bucks in however long it takes for them to root. Other people would look at this as just a big overgrown tree, another chore, just something to, you know, allow to be neglected. No, it's a money making opportunity for someone who has a money making mind. See all of this along here? These are Jerusalem artichokes. They were just planted about five weeks ago, so they're just coming up. But I'm really looking forward to those. I've never had them before. And then these giant squash plants in between the Jerusalem artichokes. You can see there's so many of these. These are one of my favorite squash slash pumpkins. They are the, the Asian squash. They're really sweet. They're shaped like a pumpkin, but they're green and they use them for tempura and they use them in a lot of different Asian dishes. Where do you think those came from? Why do you think I have so many plants? Now, if I had to buy these, let's see how many plants we have. One, two, three, four, five, six. Eight. So there's about 50 here. So each plant would have cost about five to six dollars. So that's a lot of money. I literally bought an organic Asian pumpkin. I ate it. I collected all the seeds. The seeds were fresh and I pushed them in the ground after I planted my Jerusalem artichokes. And now I have 50 free Asian pumpkin vines that are going to make a huge fall harvest of Asian pumpkins for me that I'll be able to store, eat, give away, sell, right? It's all around us. The opportunities are all around us. These, see all these banana trees? So we live, our climate's a little cooler. It's not tropical, but this is a banana that, that will live here. It has not had a good enough season yet to actually grow fast enough to produce bananas, but it's still a beautiful plant. And people love the look of a banana plant. Even if they don't get bananas, it's really dramatic in a pod or in your landscape. This started with one banana plant, the investment of one banana plant. I took that one banana plant, separated it into nine banana plants. And then this is year two, and those banana plants are making banana plants. And those little suckers, those little babies, can go right into pots. And how much is a banana tree? Well, you'll look 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 in your where you live, but they're not cheap. And here I probably have hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of dollars, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars doing something I have to do anyways. They should be separated, and getting them in pots, and um, getting them sold. You know. When I lived in Los Angeles, every year I saved my seeds, like I told you in the beginning of the video. I would take those seeds and I would propagate them, and I always had too many seeds. So one year I decided maybe I'll just take my little seedlings, because I had like 600 of them, <laughs> 600 of them, and sell them in the front yard. I'll just put them out there, 
with a coffee can and a price and you know whatever happened happens i'm not going to invest a lot of time into it and i made a couple thousand dollars a couple thousand every day i would go out there and look in the coffee can and then word went around and the next year you know people were asking about it and so if you even live in just a normal neighborhood it can be as effortless as that the marketing part of it is not difficult i also have a close friend and she loves coleus and uh, african violets so she grows the coleus in her basement under grow lights all winter long babies them finds like really exotic colors and stuff and every spring she has a literal plant sale a coleus sale at her house she advertises it on facebook and um this year she made like 1500 bucks selling coleus 1500 bucks and she's not a professional grower she doesn't have a greenhouse it's just you know she 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 got a rhythm going she got some follow through and uh and away she goes um herbs you know once you get herbs started you always have to separate them you always have to separate them so it's a great opportunity while you're separating them you take one clump you put it in the garden to grow more of the herb and then you take the other clumps little tiny clumps and get them right into pots into four to six inch pots do you know how expensive herbs are organic herbs it's so easy of course you have to keep them watered you know you do have to take care of them when they're in the pot so you have to have that basic discipline but after your second year you're going to have so much to share and sell you can cut it and dry it sell them in fresh dried bags you can make herb mixes this alone just having a prolific herb garden which is pretty maintenance free can make thousands of dollars a year thousands and you're giving people access to to medicine you know before there was medicine they used the common herbs to heal everything and um the herbs you get at the grocery store have you seen they're so expensive and who knows how old they are and what they've where they came from and what they've been sprayed with no roses if you have any roses Roses take cuttings really easily. You can propagate your roses and sell the rose bushes. Again, you just have to learn the basics of um, how to propagate. Um, these were these exotic potato seeds that I found online because my uh, friends from Colombia and she's like, oh, the Colombian, the South American potatoes are the best and you can't buy them here and blah, 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 blah. So, Sure enough, I went online. I'm like, oh, you have to be able to get, they're just potatoes. You can't buy them here because of agricultural laws. So I found this guy on the web who specializes in rare and, and uh, wild potatoes from all over the world. And I bought potato seeds, the little tiny seeds. And so now I'm gonna have my own exotic species of potatoes to propagate and sell for big money. And I can sell the seeds, I can sell the little potato starts, I can sell the plants. And the thing with potatoes, if you know anything about um, horticulture, is they tend to grow like a vine. They grow very, very quickly. So you can constantly also be clipping them because they only need to grow out like six to eight inches. You keep clipping them when they exceed by four to six inches and you keep making cuttings, cuttings, cuttings. Then you have a huge amount of potatoes potentially at the end of the year to harvest for food security or sell the potatoes as seeds and starts to other people who want to collect some different species. Or, 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 so these are all of these potatoes started at this level i only filled the soil up to here then when the plants got this tall i filled that in with dirt then when they got this tall i filled that in with dirt now they're just reaching the top but that means instead of just having potatoes to here we're gonna have potatoes going all the way down to the bottom which will quadruple our harvest 
gotta think of these things. Most people take a potato and they plant it in a little shallow pot or they just plant it on the top of the soil and they're totally missing out on the opportunity of the full spectrum of how you can maximize your money, how you maximize your crop. These are cuttings. They've taken a shock because I just clipped them and they're finicky. You know, the thing is you have to remember about potatoes is it's a tuber. And so you don't want to overwater them. If you overwater them, they hate that more than if you underwater them. I'm gonna go over to this side. So these grow bags, look how fast started these way down here. Now they're up to here already. All these inside of here is gonna be potatoes. Again, if you, you know, especially if you're doing tubers, you wanna use good organic soil because all that's going directly into that tuber. And now we're getting these tall plants, so I will cut it off here. That's gonna go into a whole nother pot. I'm gonna, by the end of the season, this whole row will be full of, these potatoes are these really fancy French fingerling tomatoes. So I had the initial investment of like 20, 25 bucks to buy the beginning ones from the internet. Um, it's called a R-A-T-T-E. And I guess they have this hazelnut flavor to them. They're supposed to be one of the most delicious baking potatoes. So that's another thing you want to do. You know, don't just focus on the common stuff. If you have something that's rare or something that's, you know, something that other people don't have, that's going to make you stand out. That's going to make people want to come back to you, look, you know, search you out because you're going to be that person that has the cool stuff, the rare stuff, the interesting stuff when everyone else has the petunias and the lobelias and the marigolds, you're gonna have the blue pea flower, the black dahlias, blah, blah, blah. You wanna be interesting. You know, if you're gonna do comp, if you're gonna compete growing things in the plant world or compete in anything, what makes you unique? You know, after service and quality, that's the next level of competition. How do you stand out from the competition? So this, all these blackberries you see here, they were all growing on the other side of the fence. So what I did, I started watering along the edge here and slowly coaxing them over with water by watering the soil. And so now I slowly have the blackberry grove growing into my yard. So next year and the year after that, I'm gonna have this huge amount of blackberries now on my side of the fence. <laughs> and again, same opportunity here. You can see how long these canes are. I'll just plant these directly into a pot and then, or into the ground, into the ground, if I want them to be propagated here or into a pot if, I want to sell it. This plant here, a lot of people don't know about this, but this is called a thimbleberry. And I brought this in from the redwood forest. It is one of the only, one of the few and only berries that can grow uh, in the low light and the high acidity of uh, dense forest, especially a redwood forest. And they produce a fantastic large red raspberry flavored berry. Not a lot of them, only one to three on the top of the crown, but it's still a great novelty. So I was like, well, it's growing wild in the forest. I've got a redwood tree in my backyard that I have my mushroom farm growing under. Let's see if I can, you know, get it growing, get it growing on the property. And if I can, then I can propagate it and, and uh, you know, uh, have the berries myself as a wild source of food. And I can sell them to people who are in, you know, who have that situation at their home that they can't grow anything because there's too much shade and they have these redwood trees, which is a large uh, part of the real estate around here. People are kind of like, oh, I can't grow anything because I live in the redwood forest blackberries these are wild roses and uh they will produce wild rose hips 
Wild rose hips is what they make a lot of vitamin C from. You can also make wild rose hip tea with them. And these are free. These are gonna have hundreds and hundreds of organic rose hips by the fall. And you could cut all those rose hips. You could sell them. You can put them in your medicine cabinet for the winter time to keep your immune system up. This is the way you think. This is the way you think. And these are the actions you take when you're not in poverty mentality. You look and see opportunity everywhere, everywhere. That's just, this is, this is how, this is what separates the rich from the poor. It's not just circumstance. It's not just family um, inheritance. It's not just um, whatever people want to excuse it away for you know there's this real venom for the wealthy right now but the fact is a lot of people just don't even try and because they don't even try they want to invalidate other people's accomplishments because that makes them feel better about themselves because they know deep inside that they haven't even tried to to do better for themselves Whatever that is, you know, I don't think, I think being, having a peaceful life that is manageable, that gives you time to do not only what you want to do, but to create valuable relationships with other people, I think that is wealth. But some people, you know, really love the game, the game of excess, you know, they love that game. It's just, it's in them. That's just, it's just their thing. So, you know, if it wasn't for those, those, those people that have those spirits, that hyper entrepreneurial spirit, um, what exceptional things would happen in the world? You know, people love to criticize the wealthy, but, you know, I'm sorry. Not a lot of exceptional things come from everyday folk you know you know would would art be developed you know would would incredible architecture be built would science advance you know we have to we have to balance this these these dark ideas out that we have with some realism there's a place for everybody and a purpose for everybody and everything so just be careful when you get sucked into these ideas because when it really comes down to it humans are humans no matter what you have or don't have humans are humans i know really shitty poor people i know really shitty rich people i know really awesome poor people working class people and i know very very awesome wealthy people so I think I want to leave it at that. I could go on and on and keep showing you more and more, but I think you have the idea. I think you have the general idea. I hope this motivated you. I don't want it to feel like it's like all critical and pointy and shrinking you. I want it to motivate you. And that's another thing that entrepreneurial people have. They don't take construct a criticism as an attack. They take it as a challenge. That's another part of the entrepreneurial spirit or someone who's going to live freely and have um, not self-victimize and not accept the mass reality. It's that you can see your own flaws and weaknesses. And if you are triggered or reacting to something, you go in and say, really, why am I feeling that way? Is it really about them? Or is it honestly about me? So I hope this video was motivational to you. If you have any questions, comments or i can help you in another any way please leave them in the comment box alone if this held value to you you like my quick money saving tips garden wisdom rants raves and art and occasional magic please subscribe and share it helps i want you to take care of yourselves take care of each other because really how we treat each other on the street that is our ultimate reality